going to the pub? No, we're in lockdown. Not that pub. The virtual pub. Stay at home, stay connected. The virtual pub. Gary Waters, thanks for joining us again. Um, sorry about our last broadcast, everyone. We, me and Gary had a nice, a delightful conversation about um, mindfulness and de- mental development, personal development and um, coaching. Um, but due to um, some technical issues, all, all of which was Gary's fault, um, we um, we had to stop the broadcast to just the communication breakdown. And with a topic as uh, poignant as this, we need continuity from start to end. So hopefully this is going to be a pre-recorded show um, please do what we are asking people, which I forgot to mention a minute ago, was that um, <clears throat> please leave any questions um, you have in the comments section of the video and anything we find and um, we, we'll, we want to answer them, basically, but we'll have to answer them off platform just because of the, um, the basically, Gary's not got a very good internet signal, so he's had to move across town um, to one of his... Um, uh, properties to uh, where he's got better internet, which is good. So we've we found a way around it, but it just means we can't do it live, which is a shame. But please do ask questions and we will get to them and Gary will willingly and wantingly answer them. Gary, could you um, tell our lovely listeners what it is you do exactly? Yeah, so I work in uh, the field of personal development, but I specialize as a mindset coach. So that's really helping people get to the, the core issue as to what's really going on uh, rather than the the symptom that they they may think is kind of driving their behavior so uh, yeah it's getting to the root cause and luckily I, I have an ability to to get to the bottom of that quite quick so that's yeah. really where I... you you told me once a really nice analogy and it was um, sort of like going to the physio thinking that your shoulders are a bit painful but really the physio whittles it down to being in your foot and your foot being you tell us the analogy because you you um, explain it much better but I think it was a really clear <laughs> way of sort of showing what what you do yeah so we often uh, think that something that's driving a certain behavior or, or a feeling it is down to something that it's not so um, you'll think oh I've got a problem in my shoulder but really it's it's down in the ankle where it's out of alignment which puts the knee out of the line which puts the hips out of the line and because of that you know I'm lifting the weight on you know a, a wrong angle for that joint so yeah. you know basically it, it isn't always what we think it is and that's why like any kind of coach whether it's fitness or whatever we just need to be able to know what to do sometimes, uh, just have a, a raising of awareness over the, the issue, and that can often resolve it. So, yeah. I mean, for me, I can resonate with it because I let's use the shoulder analogy for a minute. Um, for years, I tried sort of finding ways of curing this shoulder. Um, and you, I think when I finally, I mean, I, I had a bit of support not long ago for some um, mindset shifts and just sort of changing the, my relationship with my environment. I think we all should want to evolve and try to be a be a more efficient happy version of ourselves and sometimes we do do need a bit of support and it's um i mean i i realized that i needed to do things slightly differently and adapt and evolve um when i just kept on you know for about six seven years or so maybe even more than that just trying the same stuff i mean for me it was sort of like um material um trying to sort of find seek happiness i've always a very happy person always been a happy person um but feeling content in yourself i always trying i was always trying the same experiment and expecting a different result i think um and it like you say it's sort of i was i was concentrating on my shoulder when i should have been concentrating on something a bit deeper so and that's where you're at and you and you don't just do it on a personal level do you you you, you help businesses is that right yeah so um i i always focus on the person uh, we can often think that uh, the problem is outside of us um, and therefore we go about into our outside world trying to move the, the piece of the puzzle around so that we can therefore feel something inside. That's very much a, an outer world leading our inner world. So once I change that outside, then I'll feel happy, fulfilled, content, whatever on the inside. And so we go about trying to, like you said, with the material um, things, whether it's the car, the house, the relationship, your body, whatever your kind of trigger is, um, anything that's a trigger is often a, a sign as to where you're not free. 
So um, for me, I actually can massively empathize with you because uh, that was the pattern that I used to run. I was trying to get, trying to be the best at absolutely everything, hoping that finally I'd be good enough. And um, that is a pattern that is, uh, it runs across the world, especially in my high performers. Yeah, they, right. they, get, they get to the top of Success Mountain. They have absolutely everything. Yeah. But, but uh-oh, I'm still not happy. And the problem is there's no, there's no uh, more steps to climb on that mountain. Um, so unfortunately, they get to that point and they kind of look down and they go, well, I've done everything that you said, society, parents, whatever, not placing blame, you know, being a parent. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, um, but, you know, I, I've done everything that you've said for me to do, but I'm still not happy. And at that point, it's just complete confusion, overwhelm. And unfortunately, uh, some people either um, realize what's happened or they jump off the other side. And, you know, for myself, I, I reached that point where in the eyes of society, I, I kind of had everything, you know, number one business, great girl on my side, um, everything. But something wasn't right and I was forcing everything. I was going 16, 18 hour days, seven days a week. And yeah, it's like pressing uh, the accelerator and yeah. brake. High power to start, you burn out. So, so sorry, go on. No, and I was gonna say, you know, touching back onto something that you said before, uh, you know, you was always constantly doing the same thing uh, and getting the same result. And that's that quote by um, Albert Einstein. And I'm yeah. paraphrasing. But it's, uh, you know, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result is the definition of insanity. And, uh, you know, when I heard I'm that, insane. <laughs> you know, it was just like a mind blur for me. And I was just like, yeah, so for something to change, you got to you got to change something. And uh, when I realized it was mindset, um, it was at that lowest of points where I did burn out that I had some great advice coming from mentors. So highly recommend mentors coaches but i'm gonna yeah. say that i'm a coach you know but no yeah. i i i find them invaluable i um i'm i'm somewhat spiritual i guess and the, the guy that helped me out he um he was he wasn't necessarily your um your normal um psychiatrist i'd say he was more of a i i needed sort of carrying i think and by carrying it sort of opened a narrative within between our dynamic that allowed me to sort of just externalize my thoughts and sort of real reorientate things and reorientate my focus and also change my um, perspective on a lot of things so i actually changed my relationship with um, family in a really healthy way i've always had a really good relationship with family but um just a lot of lot of relationship uh well i i think for me it was i felt like i had to help and fix everything and everyone around me and I was responsible for everyone and I sort of realized that that wasn't the case and um, a friend of mine Nick Watson yesterday or well, a couple of days ago he said a perfect analogy and it was sort of when you're on an airplane um, <clears throat> you know you put your mask on first before helping others and I think that's something that came from the discussions I had with the, with the person that helped me it was sort of concentrating on me actually and making sure that I'm okay and then that gave me a platform to be able to support and do you find that 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 narrative is quite common. Absolutely. And um, the, the thing that is really key to understand is that we can only ever give from our kind of overflow, if that makes sense. Yeah. Most of us kind of have like, think of it like a battery where we take and take and take and we lower it so far down that when it comes to us, we've got nothing left to give. So what I kind of help people do is kind of top themselves up and then you can give. But if you're giving from, you know, a place where you don't have anything, you're, you're just going to burn out. So, yeah. What is the so, most, what's the most common, I mean, is there, there must be common denominators. Like we said, we're touching on the fact that like put, putting yourself first. Because we are, ultimately, I, I think you agree with me on this, like putting us, like we are responsible for our own happiness, not not our partners, not our family necessarily. What, what's your take on that? Yeah, it's personal responsibility. Yeah, when we get out of blame and justify why we're okay to blame, most of us are kind of caught up in this victim mode um, where we're kind of walking around blaming life as to why, you know, we can't be happy. And I used to be the king of victim mode. I, I really did. I used to um, have a story and go around and tell the story and 
we normally elevate up the story as well so we get to be the hero of it when we tell it that's a big giveaway <laughs> you know something bad happens during the day but by the time you got home you're like oh you know the tire fell off the car but it was raining but i somehow managed to hold the car up with one arm and fix it because <laughs> you, get, <laughs> you get like this double hit of like joy or kind of it's it's more like love and connection when you tell the story so you get um our poor baby from like being the victim of the story the wheel fell off the car but then you also get to be the hero of the story because then you get oh aren't you amazing you how did you do that you know you fix the right. car by but the the challenge with victim mode um charlie is that once once we're told the story there's a part of us let's call it our heart that once you get out of your head that knows that you've lied and um there can be feelings of guilt that keep coming in where you you know you've not been truthful with yourself so over time that that's got a time limit and victim mode's a real low level of energy because if you if you look at somebody who's in that kind of victim mode mentality how do they kind of hold themselves it's very gravitational it's very low stooped rather than somebody yeah. who's kind of high on life and they're like chin up they're like let's go and um, that kind of energy is much higher. It's it's more wave than particle. Um, so yeah, that that victim mode is is the most prevalent, but it's the the first to get out of and to give yourself the best shot to get out of that. You've got to give up the blame and justifying why you're okay to blame. You know, oh, I didn't get to go to that school, therefore I can't. And then you shift into like a, a buy me mode, which is um, you know, okay, I'm I'm fed up being the victim. If life gone, is going to happen, it's going to happen by me. So that's where you kind of get forceful. And that's the pattern that made me burn out. You know, right. I'm going to force, I'm going to grab it by its neck and force it in all kinds of directions so that, you know, I will kind of swim to my destination, but I'm going to force it. Right. The, the challenge with that is that you burn out because you're using up so much energy um to to kind of get to a destination you you can get there but it's exhausting yeah so, and I, and, do, and it's the do you, is it the mental shift from changing the goal as the driving force and more of the journey i don't know cause i think it i what i what I, I think what i'm getting at is like um I think it's like common in athletes. So you look at athletes, high performance athletes. Athletes have got a goal of being and orientate their life towards becoming a champion of their field. Um, and then they sort of reach their goal. I don't know if this is maybe a segue into some other conversation. Um, but it's um, but they sort of achieve their what they've set out to. And then they're sort of left with, well, what else? Am, what, what's next? What's the next goal? And maybe, yeah, I don't know. Is that, I guess that's on point. Yeah, yeah. So if we shift to goals next, because that's huge, uh, a huge awareness that, that we'll bring to the table on, on goals. Um, but yeah, the, the thing is, once you're in that achiever mode and, and you're shooting for a goal, um, you do get to the end of it to, to realize that that goal will always move. And uh, it's like desire itself perpetuating. But what people don't realize is that there's another state that you can get to, which is what I call flow. And that's where life works for you um, rather than by you. So you're, you're no longer forcing, but you're kind of living in a, a kind of synchronous reality where things just, just happen for you. And that's, that's the main part of my coaching is to shift people from that standard personal development of going victim to achiever to actually moving into flow where you, you just can kind of sit back and chill and uh, you're a lot more aligned with the flow of life rather than fight against it. Yeah. So I certainly yeah, feel that that's what I think was a big change for me was sort of not the, the success of the business, not being what is the achievement, but just the process of it just sort of, I think I'd had to recenter myself personally and sort of concentrate on me and find that just self-development and being a part of community this is I mean I'm a big socialite I love socializing I love being with my friends I love being a part of a community it's a big part of, part of life for me um but I I had to learn to be by myself um but my driving force now is sort of doing good and trying to support and help 
and that's a that's a continuous journey that never stops i'm not trying to be like a um like a pe- the person that everyone goes to it's not that it's just being out being a positive in your environment is just a constant thing and it's constantly sustaining me at least and this, i'm not trying to achieve a certain goal i'm just doing whatever i whatever i can with the tools i've been given and that i continue to to um sort of uh learn and just keep on trying to sort of help and yeah support i guess and so i you know i don't i don't want like a new phone all the time i've got crack screen I've, i don't i'm not fussed about that sort of stuff anymore i'm not fussed about having a new car I, you know i've got a new van only because it's for work and i want something reliable that keeps me working not because i want the new van um and it, that was a big big took a long time to shift that it really did yeah it's um it, it's a journey and yeah. uh, i i like to think of my life as a journey the 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 seven year ago me uh, would listen to me talk now and probably kick me in the nuts or headbutt me, you know, <laughs> it, it just, uh, in me. I, I, I was always a nice guy. I was always quite chilled. Uh, but there was always the side of me that wanted to force life to try and fit my pictures. So, you know, I'm a totally different person than I am now. And in seven years time, I'll probably be a totally different person again. So it's just being open and willing to to invalidate the model of the world that you've probably held all of your life, your, your values. Yes. And at, at least just kind of check in with those because we don't. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, we, we generally hold values and beliefs that we've held since a five-year-old. And um, I think you just have to look around to see that there's a lot of, you know, ad, uh, children in adults' bodies. Yeah. But the thing is, it's, you wouldn't wear clothes that you wore as a five-year-old. You know, you look no. a bit crazy, but we still <laughs> ground these some beliefs that we did as a five-year-old. So, you know, it, it is a journey and uh, I'm so excited to see the, the next parts of mine. And it, it's just a constant focus on, on personal growth. And um, I think that's, a, that's a, I think that's, you, you're touching on something that's really, it was very prevalent again in mine. I, I think it's good to, um, I don't want to turn this into a conversation with just me, but a lot of this is really poignant for me. And I, and I think what it was um, to, to accept that you don't have the right um, formula for your own happiness. And there's, an, there's an, a, a, a touch of ego to it. Um, and I think it's sort of accepting that, right, I haven't got this. Do you know what? I am wrong. Um, and no matter what I do, no matter how hard I try, no matter how much I smile, it doesn't make me feel any more fulfilled. And so it was, there was a like a, right, okay, I'm, I have to do something different. And I think when you get to that point, that it's not an arrogance thing. I think it's just, we all go, we all have trials and tribulations. And the fact we're still here and we're still smiling, we still have friends. We give ourselves this overinflated sense of confidence in our abilities to get ourselves out of a, or into a better place. And um, I just did everything and I couldn't. So, it was it was that like okay I relinquish control I clearly don't have control on this I need some support somebody help me <laughs> yeah it, that that's huge and it's um it's letting go it's finally being able to um, surrender to to what is happening and the thing is if you say the word surrender to kind of most people. Uh, it's got quite a negative connotation. If I say surrender to a U.S. Marine, they're probably going to headbutt me um, because it, it threatens their sense of themselves. But for me, surrender is actually one of the, the strongest words in the English dictionary because it's the hardest thing to do, to, to be able to let go, to accept what is happening or what's going on. Because the moment you can accept you actually say yes to what is going on. Most of the time we're in resistance. And if you were to watch your mind, whenever something goes wrong, it's saying no. And instantly, bam, stress kind of happens. So yeah, it's um, the moment you can surrender, you can accept, uh, you can allow whatever's happening to happen. It's not passivity. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's so not passivity. It's actually a strength beyond the strength to be able to take a step back to see what's really going on and ask yourself that question, you know, what's really going on right now? And then 
consciously respond rather than re kind of react reflexively, which is what we're trying to do. Yeah, I mean, that's literally where I was for so long. And I know a lot of my friends, a lot of my friend um, circles, are. that's really prevalent. <clears throat> and um, and it's, I mean, when I look at my friends groups, you can sort of see people at different levels of it. But it's just that willingness to want to um, be way, move from where you were and accepting, I, I don't like to use the word, but fault, just going, okay, it's not it's not like you've done something wrong it's not like you've been given two paths in life you've gone right do the right way or do the way that's going to cause me the most resistance it's just like we do our best with the tools we've been given at that time we make the best decisions and sometimes those decisions are catastrophic and some of them are okay and some of them are brilliant but it's it's i think it's like for me it was just like accepting that i did the best i could and we do the best we can sometimes we do jeopardize relationships and sometimes relationships need to be lost but as long as we're always pursuing like do, we're doing the best we can but always wanting to like build a better toolkit i call them tools like you do i think yeah yeah i think uh, uh beautifully kind of articulated there charlie but there's um there's a level of awareness that comes in that uh we kind of we kind of see what what's happening um and then we need to kind of shift because we're, we're generally brought up in, let's call it a comfort centric experience where we're, we're constantly trying to control everything in and around us. Um, one of our main driving needs as humans is certainty, which is another fancy word for control. So the moment where things don't go, go right, that's uncertainty. That's the other side of the coin on that and that then triggers uh, obviously stress because we want to try and control it but what i would welcome anybody listening to us to consider is that life is actually a growth centric experience rather than centric and you just have to look around to nature to validate that you know if you look to a tree it grows and it contributes that's you know the law of nature we just for some reason have decided that we're not a par part of nature anymore and uh, the moment you align with those of growth and contribution, you know, I, I, I know you, Charlie, you're a beautiful soul and, you know, you contribute no. so much. But once you align with those two, two kind of main needs, um, your life changes instantly. Most of our lives, we're consumed with the comfort centric way of life, which is the four main needs of the ego, which is obviously your, your certainty, your uncertainty your significance and your love and connection. And we do kind of this balancing act with, you know, those four of trying to balance our egos, trying to be comfortable. And the thing is, you know, occasionally we get it, you know, if you spin um, the roulette enough times that it falls into your number and we, we think that we can then replace it, but, um, or replicate it even, but the yeah. thing is, it's rare and it's not long before the winds of life really start blowing again and knock you knock all those four out of balance so the moment you align with growth and contribution as your main driving needs for life uh those are what i align with and that's what enables me to to live a very fulfilled life nice i mean <clears throat> i had a question in my mind then i'm going to try and get it back but um have you got any lot of sort of like um simple techniques or some like your first steps <clears throat> like progress 101 what would be a what would be a good step if you're in it if you're in that state so you're like you're striving for good business you're trying to make your family happy by providing but at the same time you're just exhausting yourself that's a common theme in my life from my friends dynamics it's like this exhaustive process of just constantly trying to keep everybody afloat and my friend used an analogy it's um swanning everything on the surface looking calm and steady but on the but below everything's like fighting against the current <clears throat> and i and i <clears throat> excuse me sorry i see it everywhere um it's really really a common theme and could you could you offer someone in that position some like for initial steps support yeah yeah um the the main master skill that you can ever learn is the ability uh to come into the present moment and get out of your head. Uh, now, that's it's also one of the uh, the hardest things as a coach to explain. 
but really um most of the time about 95 percent of the day shockingly we walk around sleepwalking we're in our heads we're thinking about the past or we're thinking about the future so if ever you want the mind to give itself away it, it talks in the language of past and future that's why uh, if you stub your toe if you check out what you was just thinking about you'll realize hmm I was just either thinking about the past or in the future, because if you're present in the moment, you don't stub your toe, you're present, you see it. So that's one of the main things is to first um, acknowledge the fact that uh, the mind works in time. And the moment that you come with your full attention into the present moment, you don't actually have a problem. It's like if I said to you right now, me and you talking, Charlie, do you have a problem right now? Like just me and you talking. Do I have a problem right now? Right now, uh, right this second, right? I guess it, um, let's think about it probably. So we've got this beautiful, incredible platform going and yeah. we're- There we go, straight away. Let's think about this. We've okay. got this incredible platform and you're about to go into a future or past or a, a future problem based on the past. Okay. But come right now, right into this second. Do you have a problem? Any no. problems right now? Not really, no. No. Got my uh, glass of water. You <laughs> yeah, you never really have a problem in the now. And if, if a problem shows up, it's the only time that you can ever deal with it is in this, this moment now. See, I can't take a conscious breath five minutes ago, and I can't take a breath in five minutes' time. Yeah? I can only take a breath now. So that's one of the main things to, if you're ever in the state of kind of over, overwhelm is to come back into the present moment. And there's certain ways to do that is to first of all, uh, recognize if you're in time, but if you do snap, kind of snap out of it is to bring your awareness to your sense perceptions. So you've got the glass of water in front of you. You know, what does the texture of the glass feel like? What's the temperature of the water when you drink it? You know, what, is around me, you know, what can I smell? What can I see? And you start to turn your life into high definition and it's absolutely incredible. Are we sort of touching, I feel like we're going to segue into sort of mindfulness now. That's sort of very familiar with me. I've, I've practiced mindfulness a little bit. Um, that sounds very much on that topic. Is that is that what this is? Yeah, yeah, that's a, it's a, it's a very powerful technique. Um, but remember, it's all interlinked. There's no such kind of thing as, you know, personal development and mindfulness, they're, they're just different modalities of the same kind of thing. So, yeah, the, the ability to become present is key because what that enables you to start to see is that there's a deeper part of you that is able to watch your mind. And if you can access that deeper part of you, you take control back over your life, over your mind. Yeah. Because if if you think about it, if you're driving along and suddenly somebody cuts you up in traffic and say you have this instant reaction to be, let's say, uh, a little bit aggressive behind the wheel yeah. and your instant reaction is, oh, I'm going to kill that guy, right? You don't go kill the guy. You, you might do that thing where you drive up quite fast behind him to intimidate him a bit or show your annoyance. But... You don't go kill the guy. So what I'm pointing towards is that in behind your thoughts is what I call the deeper you, the real you. It's the observer of your thoughts that makes the decision as to what you want to do. So the more you can connect with that deeper part of you to be more centered and present in the moment, that's where you access that observer of your mind. And then you start to be able to consciously respond to the outside world rather than react off autopilot, which is happening, right. like I said, 95% of the day. We're working off our habits. And Charlie, you know, when I heard that figure, I actually had to really go against it because I couldn't believe that for 95% of the day, I wasn't <laughs> in the game, right? It sounds ridiculous. Yeah. But what I'm talking about here is your full attention. So when your full attention is in the moment, you are aware of all everything that's going on. But it's so rare throughout the day where your full attention is fully there. 
think about it, you, you, you wake up in the morning and you've got your morning routine and you, you get out of bed in the same way. And then you go to the bathroom and you brush your teeth in the same way with the, the same toothbrush, with the same toothpaste, with the same amount of toothpaste, uh, with the same brand. And you stand in the same place and you brush your teeth the same way. And then you go yeah. into the kitchen and then you make your coffee in the same way with your favorite mug in the using the same coffee, using the same technique. And you go throughout your day conscious, you know, unconscious. Autopilot. Running off. Yeah. So the moments where we're fully here and we're, we're fully present, 5% of the day. So That's the ability. Mad, it? Yeah. But this is the, the, the game changing awareness is the, the more you can become centered and present is the moment you can bring that observer watcher in to observe not only the outer world of all your senses and your perceptions, but your inner world, your thoughts and your feelings. And that's where you, you kind of take back the remote control. I like to think of that, that deeper space of you, that observer of your mind, a bit like somebody watching a TV. So you're sat back as the deeper part of you watching the TV with the remote. Yeah. And yeah, if something comes up on the TV you don't like, you, you, ch you change the channel with the remote. But in your mind, think of it like you just place your attention on what you want to watch or don't watch, and you can change the channel. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Um, do you, so in... <laughs> I um before I got a bit of support I I practiced a bit of meditation now I wouldn't say it was overly successful but I um <laughs> I I found very useful a couple of apps on my iPhone one was called calm and the other one was uh, mind I can't remember the name of it now but calm was very good and what it was was sort of two anything from two minute meditation all the way up to three hours um and what i found it did was exactly what you're saying was it what what calm is it's sort of like a guided meditation so it's sort of you don't have to all of a sudden understand the arts of meditation and at no point is it asking you to clear your mind it's not that cliche which i put a lot of people seem to have this bit, i think it's misrepresented or misunderstood at least um but it's it guides you through it sort of ex explains that your mind's going to go out but it's also it's acknowledging that your mind's gone away and bringing it back to yourself. And I found that process very, um, it cleared my head of the chaff. And it sort of brought me into the present, as you're saying. It sort of brings you into the now. You're thinking about your breath, your body, feeling, thinking about your toes and your knees, everything. It's sort of this really amazing process. And it, took me from some pretty chaotic states in my head just sort of like all right I need to get the bills in I need to pay for this clients not paid me the builders are messing me around all of these pressures and it just sort of it gave me a bit of a mental reset and the value in that at that time was well, was invaluable like I, it was it, it allowed me to go back to work it stopped me from sort of procrastinating not that i'm not a procrastinator i am king of procrastination um give me a task i'll do it tomorrow um five minutes before it needs to be done um i'd much rather fill my day with make, making swings and, and, and drinking tea and make it do my time I, like, I want my time i don't want to be doing yeah anyway i am yeah king of procrastination um but i mean do you do you practice meditation is that something that you you value I do, I do, and I. It's um, something that I, I, I just, I won't miss in my day. It, it's kind of a non-negotiable in my mind, and I do it as part of my morning routine, uh, which I overlay to anybody that I coach or that anybody that I speak to, because um, most people's morning routine doesn't really set themselves up for a life of fulfillment. But I, 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 my main focus of meditation is in the evening before I go to sleep, because if I meditate before I go to sleep, I'd sleep so well. Um, that's been one of the biggest kind of benefits to meditation. But uh, an interesting word you used was the chaff in my head. Um, that, that voice that keeps, keeps going. 
when you look at the content of your thoughts, when you start the process of being that DPU that can observe your mind, be, um, what you start to notice is that 90% of the thoughts that go through your mind are repetitive. You know, that's the thinking mind at play. You know, 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day and 90% are the same thoughts. How so, many thoughts? 60 to 70,000 a day? Yes, that what? study showed, you know, and those are... Uh, it's mental isn't it and most of them are repeated so that it gets really fun when you start to watch your mind but as people we think that if we stop thinking that you know we need to think about stuff otherwise we won't solve it but actually one of the highest levels of awareness that you can reach is uh the realization that actually your genius thoughts have arisen outside of the the chatter of that mind the moment you become still is when fresh thoughts can actually enter into your awareness. So that's why you're, you're, you're in the shower and you have the brainstorm idea of something amazing or you're stuck in traffic and, you know, the brain's gone out, but suddenly like, bam. Now, the only way you can get a reference for that is actually to, to do this kind of work. And then you, you get out of your mind as, as quickly as you can. You know, that, that's one of the keys for high performance is. So for that reason, meditation can be uh, amazing. And the, the apps are incredible. Um, but yeah. How long did it, it take really... you? Sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. How long did it take you to sort of, when did you start? Was it a, was it a part of your, um, this process? Because obviously you had a previous career, which is what, um, and you, you had all the markers, whatever, which we all suffer from, um, sort of wrong mindset. Uh, wrong approach and then you sort of had this segue into a new business new career sorry based on self-development and wanting to support others which i commend you for um was was meditation a big part of it then and and how and how easy was it for you to start yeah um i brought it in gradually so it was one of the last things i brought in because i was quite resistant to it uh i couldn't see the benefit of sitting there doing nothing um, because I, I was still, you know, on the journey of getting out of the old mindset and getting into the new. Yeah. And like I say, for I'm 36 now for, you know, the, I think it was about 29. I, I totally broke down and burnt out, but it took 29 years of that programming to really solidify it in, to make me who I thought I was. Uh, I wasn't going to solve that in five minutes. And that that's a key thing to overlay. It does take time, but you yeah. can one do it so meditation for me was something that um i developed but it's a skill really uh it gets a lot of kind of spiritual and weird thoughts around it but really it's concentration training it's focus training and when i finally when i finally realized that being able to meditate was um i was able to bring in that deeper part of me that actually was the decision maker um that was a great incentive to meditate because now uh, you said to me recently, Gary, you're, you're really calm. I and did. It's, yeah. And it's because I have the ability to be not instantly reactionary with my old kind of habits to see them for what they are because I'm connected as that deeper part of me. Yeah. 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 You're, you're the calmest man I know. And I, and I, I think that's something I learned as well. I was very reactionary, very defensive. Um, and I still do. I, it used to be my default. And I sometimes revert back to it, but I don't call it reverting back to my default any, anymore. It's like there's been time between. It's just I sometimes find myself back in that place. It's, um, but it's as you, from, the, from that process of acknowledging you need to sort of move on from where you were, knowing that you weren't having the most efficient relationship with your environment, um, you do find yourself reverting back to default. And I used to be like, oh, come on, we said we wouldn't do this. And I was quite heavy yeah. and hard on myself. And I realized that you can't help it. It's your, literally, it's your default. And like you say, if we spend 95% of our day being autonomous, effectively, um, it's understandable that you'd sort of radiate back to back to that default state but um i'm really oh, charlie sorry mate i was i was gonna say you're so on it i, I don't mean to interrupt you but you're so oh. right and you're so on it 
And um, the thing is, it's the, it's the small incremental changes. I talked about accessing that flow state before. Um, it's not the big one thing that you do that, con yeah. you know, that changes it. it's, um, it's a bit like uh, trying to steer a, a tanker on the ocean. Yeah, if, if you just change the, the compass style just one degree, at first it doesn't look like the tank is turning. And what most people do is they turn the wheel back and go, oh, it's not, it doesn't work. Yeah. But the thing is, you stay true. You know that you've turned the wheel. That tanker eventually turns and you end up in a totally different destination to where you would have done over time. Yeah. That is a sick analogy. I love it. Oh, I'm using that one, Gary. Using Mate, that, steal stealing it, like, it plagiarizing it. It's not, what I'll say is it, it's not mine. You know, Fine. everything that what I'm overlaying is um, then learned from my mentors who are incredible. Um, but no, what I want to say to you, Charlie, is that we you will fall into that unconscious mode. I call it unconscious, like sleepwalking. You know, you're conscious in your body, but, you know, you're unconscious in your mind. Your attention isn't fully in your sense perceptions. Um, you're human. Yeah, we're human. I'm human. Yeah, you, you're going to you're going to get hooked by stuff. Yeah. S certain things are going to hook you. And, you know, I don't have to say to you, Charlie, what are your problems? I just have to ask you a different question. I yeah. just have to ask you what you're placing the most importance on because um, it's what we place the importance on that hooks us the fastest. So our close relationships, our family, our friends, when those get threatened, we, we those are the things that really hook us the fast, like the fastest. So to be able to acknowledge that you're going to get hooked, you're human, yeah? Yeah. It, it's, it's the length of time that you stay hooked that defines the quality of your life. So the faster you can unhook by becoming the conscious you, the deeper part of you that sees that you've got hooked, yeah, that's incredible. In fact, what I say to all my clients is at that point, they go, oh, no, I got hooked. I'm like, no, celebrate that you got hooked, but yet you pulled yourself out of it because yeah. you only pull yourself out once you're conscious. Otherwise you're lost unconscious in the program. See, um, this is, I mean, it's, I guess it's really easy to sort of, um, not really easy. That's a really word, horrible uh, phrase to use. It's easier to evolve personally when you're on your own so if you're single for instance don't have children around you you don't have loved ones um but i when you i've certainly been in relationships where you can sort of feel your own dynamic within your relationship with your environment changing um but you've got a partner with the expectations of you being the same person per se um have you got any sort of tips to navigate conversations um to and also tips for, for, for couples, maybe both in, in a sort of if inefficient state. Yeah. Yeah. So the key is communication. Um, if you can have some trigger words where if you uh, are both on a journey, say a personal growth, where uh, you notice that the others got triggered. Well, from a place of calm where you're both kind of in the moment agree on some terms, maybe like a, a trigger word where you can say, just say it out loud. Um, and that will hopefully then bring them back into the moment. Uh, it's not a judgment. It's just, oh, hey, do you want to check back in? What's really going on right now? So that's really helpful to be able to do. In fact, triggers are amazing. Whether you're alone or in a relationship is that if you're unconscious 95% of the day, if you're working off that autopilot system, then if you're only conscious 5% of the day, it's going to be really hard to keep bringing yourself back with your full attention in this game, let's call it. Yeah. So what's, what's really helpful to do is to use uh, physical triggers, which is uh, like post-it notes that you stick everywhere, uh, which can just say now uh, on it to bring you back. Uh, I found that. <laughs> Simple in as that. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, I, I stuck. Uh, but this is this is a really important key. Is because because we are so habitual in our nature. Because we know exactly what we do every single day. 
you therefore can hack that system by using physical triggers to go stick them on everything that you know you're going to use and everywhere that you're going to be. So I had yellow post-it notes on my car steering wheel. I had them on my toothbrush that I had to take off so that I'd read it. Um, and I had them everywhere. And in places where I wasn't comfortable maybe with now, I'd, I'd have a smiley face. And if anyone asked me, I'd be like, oh, it's just a reminder that, you know, to smile sometimes. <laughs> so, and it works great with kids as well. Um, you know, you can do it with kids if they're like, oh, mommy, daddy, what are you doing? What are those all for? It's just like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm using them as a, as a tool to get my attention span back. So because I'm spending so much time on the computer and it's not making me feel good. And they're like, oh, maybe I shouldn't spend. Some time. So, is it important then to sort of um, assess your own life and your own family dynamic, and sort of see where maybe your attention's been diverted, and sort of where you could be bringing it back? And I think what you touched on is, um, for me, in my opinion, in relationships, what's key is um, open dialogue and transparency with how we're feeling, um, and trying to create a, a narrative together that allows us to both support and to be each other's foundation um and you can't do that if you're at loggerheads if you're you know if, if there's tension and pressure it's you, usually it's like an expectation of your partner to do a certain thing we build these these sort of um images of what we want our partner to be and how to act and i and i think it's breaking down those barriers and then sometimes you you i i've been guilty of it in the past you have your own expectations of what you want your partner to be and to how to, hurt, to how to act i know that sounds really bad but that's just what we do i think and um I, and i think that evolutionary process for me and finding support that well, that was one of the biggest changes in my my relationship with my environment was my relationship with my partner was it i was no longer needing a partner to um it was never a case of i had to have a partner to be happy but that was definitely a part of it um and it was changing that that was a and being true to myself and understanding that and recognizing it and talking to my partner like we, me and my partner now we have very open dialogue about that sort of stuff um and, and it certainly makes our relationship dynamic efficient not perfect but definitely efficient yeah yeah amazing um i'm having incredible. this conversation with her next to me and she just went we are perfect <laughs> yeah no, <laughs> Like a right hook coming um mate that's uh you're right on point um the the challenge we're brought up in the, in this model where um where it is very much like i'm this half c and i'm like looking for my other half c so that we can be a whole together and you you're walking around believing that you're not whole already and the problem with that is that you're constantly needing something uh to make you whole and you cannot love that which you need because you'll always need that to feel whole so that's that's one of the the biggest misnomers um around relationships and and another one you kind of said is that you know most relationships and it relates also across the business as well, as well. Right. it's a really nice way of, of um marrying up the two but, you know, if you're in a, a relationship, let's call it a level one, where you're purely self uh, selfish and everything is about me, uh, then, you know, that relationship normally doesn't last very long. Uh, it's like, how can I get my needs met? And then you've got the level two, which is um, you meet my needs. Um, I meet your needs. We're in agreement. So let's get married. And the thing is, most people are in that kind of transit transactional almost like a business exchange relationship where you know if you meet my needs if you do what i'm expecting you to do and i do what you're expecting me to do then you know everything's okay but the problem is is that our needs change and as soon as somebody is seen to be not pulling their weight maybe they get home from work and they put on sky sports rather than you know go help out with the kids instantly you've got that that uh, kind of friction there. And that can really build. Whereas um, there's the next level of relationship, which is as corny as it sounds, but available, unconditional love. And it's exactly what it says on the tin, love without conditions, you know, no matter what you do or no matter what you don't do, I love you. And um, that's a place, a, a journey that we kind of work towards. But it's recognizing sometimes that, you know, our needs change and shifting with those 
as consciously as you can. So you're saying that last state is sort of the the, the destination. Uh, I believe so. You know, I do, can. It, could you do you think you could have like um, someone that is overly passive and just allowing that allows everything and gives the illusion that that's the state, but really it's just they just need someone to be there and are willing to allow any behaviour. Yeah, it, it, it can be tough in, in, in language and in, in communicating this across, but uh, yeah. that's going to show up. You know, that pattern will show up with a result. And um, it, it's generally not a good feeling one. Yeah, if, if I'm passive, if, uh, if I'm allowing everything, that's kind of not what I'm talking about. Yeah, we've, we've got to stand in our own power and our own presence. But it's, uh, it's the ability to be with that person unconditionally, to understand them, to want to have that dialogue like you, you spoke about, where you can be vulnerable with that other person uh, yeah. to a degree that you don't feel like they're going to judge you, where they can yeah. hold a safe space for you and you can hold a safe space for them. I think you touch and on something. Where... I think you touched on something really, um, again, one of the most important traits in a relationship is um, transparency my last relationship we've all had faults we've all done stuff done things um and i felt i've been completely transparent and what that allows you to do is to not feel like it allows you to feel um genuine and authentic and not disingenuous and if you're sort of i think if you're holding stuff back um in my opinion it just causes you um it causes you real anguish actually it certainly did for me um not that anything was i was uh holding anything back in the awful you know i wasn't a, a serial cheat or anything i've never never been that it's um yeah. it's just elements of you that you think your partner maybe wouldn't be happy with um and i think yeah. that that just being completely open like i think i i was single for about two and a half years and i just got to a state where i was like do you know what I want the next person I'd be with. I just want them to see every element of me. Not that, that wasn't the case in the past, but I, I realized more about myself that I didn't realize in previous relationships. And I wanted all of those new sights, those new perspectives to be acknowledged and to be received and then to be wanted effectively. And I think that was a huge part of um, my current relationship and why I think it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, I fully agree. You know, the, the challenge is if you look at, say, a first date, for example, when you go out on that first date, you put your best foot forward, not um, revealing the one that you're dragging behind you that stinks. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's kind of like we play this game, whether it's the first date or, or a job interview where we, we're portraying the best part of us, we're filtering. And that's why I always come back to that deeper you, the observer of your mind, because I always just like to ask who's doing the filtering. Yeah, it's that deeper part of you. So the moment you you can release that that information that you feel like you're going to be judged on, be vulnerable enough to, to actually say it, what you normally find is that people actually love that about you. See, so one of the main driving needs that we have is significance you know getting the car getting the house whatever it is so that i can be good enough not realizing that you know if you get those kind of people you see somebody in the yellow ferrari or whatever and they're boasting and they're like oh look how significant i am how much do you like that guy not normally at all no and and the, the crux and the absolute main realization on this is that the less significant you try to be, the more significant you actually become. And that's a, a, a huge uh, lesson for any of the, the younger guests watching. If I could have one message to um, my younger self, which I think is always a great and beautiful question to ask, you know, if you could give your younger self some advice, it would be that is to um, really get off that game of trying to be good enough. Because yeah. uh, that, that, that is the game you'll, You'll never win until you realize you're born a freaking miracle. And um... I mean, my, mine would be to whatever your sort of whatever situation you're presented with, always try and take the 
best path and the nice in the do your best in that situation if you can what's an example here um i don't know if you've got friends around you and they're like when i was younger you had friends that the, the naughty naughty kids in school like sit back question it is it something you want to be a part of and maybe think about it that mindfulness thing comes back in again isn't it sort of like assess okay does this route do i really want to do this i don't know if that's a good analogy actually no I think, well I, I i i can try and help you out yeah um, do. i think what <laughs> Yeah, one of the, one of the game changing things. If if you if you want to improve the quality of your life almost instantaneously, is to upgrade your peer group, and that can get quite a kickback uh, when I say that to people because we're conditioned to believe that because we've been friends with someone for twenty years that they've got to stay in our life. Well, sometimes the people that get you from A to B don't get you from B to C, and it's about being okay with that. It's uh, it's not about nice. getting. Yeah, it's not about getting rid of people like you're not good enough for me. I'm this new improved Gary and, you know, all that crap. That's not true. There's ways to upgrade your peer group. And I make sure I explain this to people how to do it in the right way. But if you if you hang around with nine go get an entrepreneurs who look after their health and um, their body and their nutrition and, and their mind, you become the 10th. Yeah, it's it's <clears throat> it's the law law of conformity but if you yeah. hang around with fine people who, are, who eat kfc who uh, take drugs and watch daytime tv no judgment whatever it's all cool uh, but you become the tenth of that yeah you do yeah. it through law of conformity i so what, i just want to touch on i don't think i think it's important to like the whole kfc comment and the drugs comment i think it's it's important to recognize that there are healthy healthier relationships and unhealthy relationships and i use this analogy and that is that you can have someone that has a glass of wine with a meal um that's their relationship with alcohol that's not an unhealthy relationship with alcohol in my opinion these are completely my opinions and then you've got someone that maybe goes out for a drink at the weekend or binge drinks at the weekend or someone that needs a drink after every night each one of a very different levels and different relationships with alcohol and i think it's important to identify that and to assess whether you think your relationship with what you're doing is and that's that could be with anything though right we've gone into a segue into uh, addictions here <laughs> wow um but that could be shop that could be shopping it could be anything though couldn't it you can have a bad relationship with absolutely anything um drugs is and alcohol are super prevalent because i think they're very quick to allow you to escape from a negative headspace but they are in no way no way um the tool to navigate you through a tricky episode and out into greener pastures it's just not they very short-lived and then huge crashes um but yeah so i just because you, you mentioned kfc and i think it's important to point out that um there are different relationships with all these things so not all of just because you do one doesn't make it unhealthy yeah yeah so i i uh... The one thing that I, I apply to my life is zero judgment, but I, yeah. I do recognize things that make me feel good and the things that don't. So, for example, um, we've known each other a long time. We've only become like close friends in the last few years. But, um, you know, for anybody that knows me, I used to be a huge party guy. You know, I used to be out every weekend yeah. getting smashed. And that was part of the thing that led me to totally burning out because when you're working 16 to 18 hour days, and then going out at the weekend and you're up at 5 a.m. to do like the hotel breakfast. Welcome to my life. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, um, you know, you're going to burn out. So I recognize that um, for me, alcohol, I don't really drink anymore. You know, I'm, I'm not a big party guy anymore. Uh, I did a video recently where I was, it was Saturday night and I was on my couch and it was like <laughs> kicked back with a book. You know, things have really changed. Nice. Um, it's it's whatever makes you happy right now. Um, I'm so happy I had those experiences. But you know, for me, the main one, and I'm just going to touch on alcohol quickly, is that if the main part for me to be fulfilled and to be able to consciously choose the the right choices that feel good for me in my life, so the ability to become present in the moment, yeah, and to access part of me, well, that's focus. The ability to be focused and what i discovered is that when i drank alcohol it made it really hard to access that deeper part of me 
And I was then so unfocused, it would take almost like a week for me to get back to that place where I felt like I was back to being me again. And I, I didn't like that feeling. So for me, it was an yeah. easy trade. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm a DJ and I work, I've got an electrical company and then I DJ weekends. And you, when I sing, you frequently found myself at parties, it happened a lot. Um, but what I made sure I had, um, I, I never found myself and never have found myself using um, parties and socializing as my only form of um, release. Um, I always been really active like I, I've been pretty active in climbing for the last two and a half years less so in the last six months um, but yeah I climb I ride I get out and see friends I go on big walks those things are as important if not more important than you know being out and partying that I, I enjoy that time I enjoy the socializing I love being with friends I love love that relationship dynamic I love going out and listening to music and going to clubs and going to festivals I enjoy it but they are they're, they're, it's like one way of going out and having fun it's not the only way it's I, for me it's important that i have my own solitude like i like climbing and i like climbing on my own like um i i enjoy it i find real peace in it um but i don't know it didn't it's i think yeah that's what i'm getting at it's just making sure you've got other ways of um venting and releasing calming. Yeah, i think we come back to the it's a journey you know, for out my 20s, I, that was the part of my life. It was the party time of my life. You know, I did a load of traveling around the world at that time of my life. Um, and I, I look back and I don't regret any of it. Yeah, there were some poor decisions in there, but there were some decisions actually that are now right on the top of my gratitude list. Yeah, my toughest moments are right at the top of my gratitude list because if those things don't happen, then I'm not who I am today. So, like, uh, the best advice I could give to anyone who's a bit younger is if that feels right, well, do it. But at the same time, check in, you know, do it consciously. You know, do I need to drink 12 pints? P probably not. Is <laughs> no. it carried on? Yes. You know, we're all at different stages. It's acknowledging where you're at. Everything is a relationship, whether it's uh, with a person with yourself, with your body, you know, that one ends as well one day. It, it's, you know, all our relationships end at our different parts of our journey. And it's just being able to see those and just doing what feels right for you, what feels good. And I think gratitude is um, is a big thing. And, and self-love, people call it arrogance. I, I think arrogance is misappropriated sense of, overinflated sense of self where you think you're more than you are. But I think it's good to um, acknowledge the things you're good at and you make time for and pat yourself on the back for it. Um, and gratitude for people around you. You know, I'm always saying thank you for things. My friend, People say you just stop being so nice. It's actually really not being helpful in business sense because people like hard ass. <laughs> like, um, you know, business. I, I struggle in business because I want to form relationships with all of my customers and all the people that work with me. I'm like, I all of a sudden become transparent and want them to be my best mate. And that's not always the best way. So <laughs> I'm, find, I'm finding my... Well, Go on, you're going to teach Charlie, wrong. In business, actually, um, I'd, I'd say you're actually right on point. You just haven't given it enough time for those relationships to yield the results. Nobody likes the hard-ass business guy. Um, the key for business, authenticity, and how can I add value? The only things you need. Yeah. Um, you know, if, if you just continuously add value over and beyond what you're expecting back, you will succeed in business every single time. That's the shortcut to success in business. But Fair enough. It's... Um, yeah, you're actually right on point. Work on those relationships because um, that they those will yield you the uh, the results that you want. Um, you touched on gratitude. You know, there were a few things that that you actually said where people said, "Oh, stop being so nice." And what what this actually comes into is um, we we have this this fear of the the good opinion of other people. I know that you don't live in this space, but uh, most people do, and I did for most of my life, and it was constantly trying to be good enough and, uh, you know, constantly doing stuff or not doing stuff, fearing that we'll be judged for it. And uh, so when, when you can own yourself 100%, where you don't really mind what other people think of you, that's freedom. 
that is just su such a pure freedom state of mind how do you get to that i'm i'm One lucky very... i'm lucky i right. i'm it took me a long time to get to that and i'm not saying i'm there but i'm certainly i concentrate on my own vision i know that i'm working hard i know that i do my best to support the people around me but i realize i'm I don't try and help everybody and anybody and I'm not trying to be everyone's best friend. It's just, I recognize my capacity, but also I just recognize my own drive and where I want to be. But it, I had my way of getting there, but what's your way of getting there? For me, it came in a, in an, in a, bleh, can't talk there, analogy from <laughs> one of my men, a guy called Peter Sage. And he's got, a, he's got a movie star analogy. And uh, when I heard this and I'll, I'll overlay it here, um, for me, it was just such a game changer. So it's um, basically we we think that we are the star of the movie of our life and we walk around and we think that everybody is is looking at us as the star of the movie and uh, everybody else to us. You know, our close relationships are maybe co-stars, but everybody else is an extra. Yeah. So. We walk around and we're the star and everybody is looking at us as the star of our own movie. I resonate but what with that. We don't actually, yeah, and what we don't realize is that everybody else is doing the same thing. See, for them, they are the star of their own movie. At best, you're a, a co-star, but most likely, what are you? Um, an extra. <laughs> you're an extra. You're, you're an extra. Everybody thinks that everybody else is looking at each other. And the, the truth of this is that nobody cares enough about you to give an opinion on you because they're too busy worrying about what you're thinking about them. And when I heard that, I was just like, <sighs> because I realized that, I'll say it again, nobody cares enough about you to give an opinion on you because they're too busy worrying about what you're thinking about them. And when you wake up to that, you're just like, oh, I can stop playing the game. It's really profound to get to that point. And I'm really lucky and blessed to feel um, that I'm, I'm not a star of my own show anymore. <clears throat> and um, that's not me being arrogant. That's just me accepting that and patting myself on the back from going from where I was to um to evolving really and i've still got a long way to go and i think again like touching on what we said earlier on it's just accepting that this you know you said earlier on you know the person you are now is going to be different to the person you're going to be in 10 years time um but i'm looking forward to that journey i'm looking forward to moving forwards um i, th I, I just want to touch with the people that are watching if you guys have got questions um for gary um or me if I have no idea. Maybe you got, I missed something and something I was saying resonated. Um, uh, put them in the comment section and we will be having another interview very soon with Gary and maybe we can answer your questions. Um, but we would love, 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 love for you to get in contact. We had a really nice comment from a lady last week who said oh, it's nice to have um, some, she used the words, male role models. And I think it was just because you don't really have these conversations happening a lot online. I certainly don't see them. I've wanted to have them for a little while. And that's one of the reasons why I got Gary on because I know <clears throat> Gary navigates a conversation that seldom happens. Um, so if, yeah, if we can, if we or Gary can offer you some support in terms of answering some questions and helping you, then please, please, please leave them and we will get back to you. How are you feeling, Gary? feel great it's good isn't it it's nice to have the chat i'm loving it i feel like it's a conversation that is almost endless because it is yeah. but i think i think for the moment we've got enough content there for people to sort of to enjoy listening i, I don't want to take it too far I, I, is there anything you feel that would be worth bringing on to the table no, I think that I think we've thrown we, we covered every spectrum. Um, <laughs> I think so. You know, I, I don't know. I, I, I think you know when if you do a, a maybe a little intro into it and just say you know we me and Gary we always jump around gears in our conversations because we do. Yeah. Um, 
it's just like come along for the ride it's uh, it's been fun but no I'm, i agree with you i feel like the conversation can just keep going i could talk to you all day long um if i did <laughs> same <laughs> an interview to do then I, I i probably would i'd be like hey let, let's just keep talking um but yeah, I think I think put it out there, see if there's anything that comes back and maybe we can do like a Sunday section thing where yeah. I can come back and we get a group of people together. Uh, maybe bring Nick on. Uh, I would love that. I'd love to bring people on. We do that. So just to sort of inform you, you lovely folk, if um, this is the first video you've seen on the virtual pub uh, platform, um, Sundays live, we have, uh, we broadcast a mental health day effectively mindfulness discussing people's stories getting some um some hosts in we had gary in this sunday sadly we had connection issues uh, we had tom chapman in on the sunday evening show he's a ted talker um and the founder of the lion barber collective um he was a great great chat as well we had um had a long chat with some real nice topics raised within that um slightly different material to what me and um gary here are talking about but um, it was it was incredible. Both 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 interviews were incredible, in my opinion. I, I loved them. I got a lot from them. Um, but let's um, let's say uh, goodbye and let's say look forward to your comments and look forward to you engaging with you later. But yeah, please, we'd love to get you on the show. Is what I was going at. Get you on the show and um, get you talking with us live. You don't have to have your face on. You can just sit there with with the audio and be like a radio show. Um, but yeah, please get involved. We'd love it. Gary, thank you so much. Thanks, Charlie. It's been a pleasure. No, pleasure is honestly all mine. And um, let's uh, let's speak soon. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you.